Okay. So is that better? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> such that it is. <laughs> uh, so in lighting two, you'll recall that uh, I had you guys lighting for themes. And um, the idea was each week you're going to try a different theme and, and try to articulate what the differences were in the lighting style and, and what you were doing differently to evoke those kinds of moods um, uh, non-verbally uh, in the material, right? And so we started coming to certain conclusions like uh, in week two when you're doing horror and sci-fi. So you do, you do comedy in week one. And you realize that that's kind of a flat front Philly kind of backlight emphasis, uh, sort of broad field lighting so that somebody who's ad-libbing and running around uh, doesn't have to conform to a dramatic uh, standard of lighting where if they move off their mark uh, a little bit this way or that way, all of the, all of the creative uh, emphasis is ruined. Um, so comedy being the, we call it high, wide and stupid, you know, flat front fill and heavy backlighting. Uh, we move from that kind of style to horror, which is heavily backlit with no front fill often, or, uh, moderately backlit with uh, low, uh, front fill, uh, or several variations on, on those themes and sci-fi, how it was start starting to look similar, but there were ways of adding or subtracting light from a horror scenario that could make it look or feel more like science fiction if we change some things like added color or changed from low fill to top fill or um, added interactive lighting, colorful interactive lighting uh, versus front fill and simply back key lighting. Um, so... But what we didn't really do is simply explore the idea of just moving the key light around before we add any other ingredients to the sauce. You know, the first thing you want to do is you want to get you want to get the major idea of what the sauce is about. Is it creamy? Is it tomatoey? Is it pestoey? Is it spicy? Is it savory? Is it sweet? You know, and then we start adding little accents here and there that start making it uh, take on a life of its own. Uh, well, the lighting can be the same way, and, and so uh, a good exercise is for you to start thinking about the key light is not necessarily coming from 45 degrees off axis to, to the lens. The key light might come from behind the subject. Um, in fact, the most common time that I can think of that being the case, 99% of the time being the case, is uh, when we do a... Um, like on a cop show or a murder mystery or something, we do the night exterior alley shot, you know, where the guy's going down the alley looking for clues at the scene of the crime and it's nighttime and it's in an alley. And so if you front light something like that, it, it obviously does not take on the characteristics of night exterior, uh, let alone does it do any justice to the subject or to the alley, the set itself. Right. We find that a lot of times in night exterior, uh, shot of a sit of an alley in a back city street is where the backlight's coming down and it's putting a nice highlight on everything on the on the sides of the walls coming down and we see nice kicks off the either the asphalt or cobblestones or whatever and things uh, things get silhouetted in the background that we we want that information but we don't want all the information we just like to know oh wrought iron fence or oh garbage dumpster or uh, fire escape or whatever, but we don't need all the detail that we would normally have to suffer through in a day exterior of the same location. So the backlight of the alley looks great. Well, if that's the characteristic or the tone of the alley in the first place, why would we ever use a front key light on a character standing in that environment? Unless there's some justification for it, like if the character happens to be picking through the picking through the garbage bin behind the Chinese restaurant and the kitchen back kitchen door is open and the chef comes out and boosh, throws a bucket full of dishwater out into the alley. Yeah. Then maybe we have a key light that looks like it's coming from the doorway out of the Chinese restaurant. But until that door gets kicked open and Yang comes out with the dishwater, our key light technically is whatever is backlighting the alley. Okay. So, 
the idea that the key light in the beginning of that scene would be three quarter front, and then for some reason a door opens that introduces light from another world into our existing world, and nothing changes would be kind of an absurd uh, uh, miscarriage of justice in terms of lighting if we didn't acknowledge some kind of interactive change that happens when that exchange occurs. So in the beginning, our key light has to have more of a sense of the environment that it's generated within. So if, if the alley is being backlit and it's half blue in color to, to psychologically indicate that it's night exterior and there's a lot of heavy contrast and deep shadows, then our key light's probably going to want to take on the same characteristics until our character enters into something or does something to change that relationship. Now, for instance, night exterior and dark in an alley. The key light is our backlight. The character can't see what he's doing, but he sees something on the ground. He picks it up and he, he lights a cigarette lighter to see what he's holding in his hand. Right? Now our key light is the cigarette lighter. But prior to that, the key light was the backlight. Now, some people would argue theoretically that the backlight re remains the key light and that the cigarette lighter has become an interactive fill light. And that may be the case if that if you don't end that shot on, on the cigarette lighter and the evidence in his hand, if something else transpires after that where the cigarette lighter goes out and he does something else with this evidence, maybe sticks it in his pocket or whatever, you know, then you can say, yeah, the cigarette lighter was an interactive fill light. It was only momentary. It was there as a mechanism to allow us to see the article in his hand. It was create a creative license or a choice that we made. Um, or you can say, well, you know, uh, if he lights the cigarette lighter and he's looking at the evidence in his hand and then he calls his partner over and the partner comes over into a split two shot and they consider the evidence together and the shot ends on some profound piece of dialogue when the lighter is still, light, still lit, then we've just changed our point of key from the backlight to the cigarette lighter. Is it starting to make sense? Right. Yeah, the, I, I, I do have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, one of my lights, the one with the three switches on it, anytime that I use the middle switch when it's turned on, I get a flicker. And the I see that in my camera. You get a flicker the entire time or just when it's firing up initially? Um, it's pretty much most of the time. But then when I turn that off, the other two are on and don't flicker. That's interesting. Um, you think the ballast is bad in it? In the bulb itself, possibly, yeah. Um, the thing of it is, is those fixtures are all individually switched. So having one or three on shouldn't affect the performance of any one particular bulb. Um, unless the overall draw to the fixture itself is approaching now whatever that one ballast can handle. That's very possible. Um, okay. Does it happen with all five globes in? No, only, um, only the middle switch. Anytime that's on, it starts to pulsate or flicker. When that middle switch is off and both end switches are on, it works fine. And did you try that same bulb in a different socket to see if it was the bulb that flickers or if it's the socket that flickers? Yeah, I switched the, I switched the bulb from an, another lamp and put it in there, and it did the same thing. Okay, so it's not the bulb, and the driver would be in the bulb. So uh, the only other thing it could be is the switch. Um, the switch could be bad. It could be, uh, it could be uh, on the way out where it needs to be replaced. Um, there could be a loose wire in there, but it's it's hard to say. And there's not much to go wrong inside that fixture other than that switch. Right. Um, it, it, uh, it might be possible to replace the switch. Um, I mean, they cost about maybe a dollar fifty from Radio Shack or something equivalent to that. Um, it might involve a little soldering or 
uh, it might be uh, it might be worth sending the fixture to uh, Studio Pro and seeing if they want to fix it under warranty. How long have you had the light kit now? Less than a year. Uh, I think it was early 2014. I think I got it. So it'd be a little over a year at this point, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just ordered um, some real studio lights from uh, Amazon. What'd you get? Fresnels. Yeah, for now. Tungsten, yeah. Um, I want, I want, it's the way I used it at school is like we were used to the barn door spotlights and everything, and that lighting looks so great. Yeah. And we have these soft boxes, and it's just hard to get that same look. Yes, it is. Um, uh, obviously, you can take the diffusion off the front, but it's only going to, it's only going to harden it up uh, so much um, because of the reflector. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm in the I'm in the process actually of arguing uh, with uh, the powers that be to uh, to uh, sort of discontinue that lighting kit and go with LED panels because I feel like moving forward the cutting edge of technology and the and the most popular uh, form of lighting right now, especially on small interview sets and things like that, ENG sets are these one by one light panels and. Uh, actually, the company that makes your fluorescent lighting kit uh, makes an outstanding little one-by-one -one panel, uh, similar to this guy, um, by color. So it's tungsten or daylight, um, and it's got a um, it's got about 600 by color LEDs in it, and it does a really great job. Um, but it again is another soft source, so it's not going to give you the hard focusable directional punch of a, of a Fresnel. Um, the only caveat obviously is your Fresnels are going to be tungsten balanced, but, um, that's not terrible. I mean, if you're shooting inside and you can set the camera to, you know, to 3,200 Kelvin and, and, uh, white balance for those tungsten fixtures, then you're good to go as far as that goes. Um, I think it's smart for you to try those kinds of tools, um, and get them in your arsenal because there's not, uh, there's not one light that's going to be ideal for everything you're ever going to want to do. And, uh, and uh, being able to focus and cut and shape uh, a hard light source is definitely something that, uh, you know, in a lighting career, you're going to need to do that uh, quite frequently. So um, that's interesting. Um, we'll have to uh, – I wonder how many of the other students are, are, are reaching the point uh, at your level where they feel like, uh, the conversation needs to broaden out to discussing that kind of lighting, whether or not I, I can put together, uh, some lighting scenarios for you guys, some videos to watch. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, agree with that, with what David said. And, and actually my, um, my backlight for the kit it is actually broken and I can't use it. Um, and it's, it's nothing that I did. I didn't force it or anything. Just the bulb just totally uh, where it screws in and just wore out the, there's like a metal strip. Um, I, I don't know what it's called, but, uh, it's just ripped out of there. Inside but, the um, pocket. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, I think, I think probably the biggest issue is I think, uh, those large globes that you guys have that they called 1K that you have in your kit, I believe they're 65 watt fluorescent, right? It says that on the bottom. They're 85 watt. 80 watt? 85 watt. Yeah, see, mine, mine says 65 watt. Uh, not that it matters because um, the socket, the sockets that are in that kit, if it's a plastic socket, um, they're really only rated to, uh, well, they're rated to 600 watts um, incandescent, but I find over time they just don't, uh, they just don't hold up. I mean, eventually they're going to, they're going to get um, sort of brittle and yeah. start sort of cracking. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I would also just say that they're difficult to transport around too. <laughs> Listen, man, you know what? I mean, you're preaching to the choir. I, you know, I took one look at that kit and I was like, what? I was like, yeah. what, uh, what do you expect the guys to do with this stuff? You know, now, right. 
you know, a soft box is a nice tool. A, a light modifier is a great thing to have. Don't get me wrong. But uh, you guys now, if you think about it, you guys are doing a lot of lighting every week for close to three years, for two years at least. And uh, that's probably pretty close to the duty cycle of that little light kit. And it's probably, you know, you guys are now, what, month 22 of your program? You probably, those lights are probably pretty well tired. Yeah. Um, so it's a bummer that you lost your backlight. But, um, you know, it's time, maybe it's time to start uh, expanding your kit a little bit. Um, Dave, well, I, whoa, whoa. Two, go ahead, Anthony. Question. Sorry, I got two okay. questions. One is, is that something that the school would help us out with? Um, and then my other one is, I, I actually did, um, on my end, I got an 800-watt tungsten Fresnel. Um, it's yeah. cheap. It's actually from the Favatech. They were on sale. It's a little redhead. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And the open face. And I mean, you know, I like it. I, I've read some reviews that those are, you know, they might blow up on you too or melt or whatever. But, um, but is it okay for, for example, like this assignment with the um, this lighting assignment that we have this weekend? Is it okay to use that instead of the um, the daylight bulbs? Yeah. Kit? Of course. Okay. Of course it is. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing of it is, is see now I've had you guys for like two or three classes now and, and I know what kind of work you're doing and I know, you know, what you're, what you're trying for, what you're striving for. And I see week by week what your progressions are. So I have no pro. I mean, I wouldn't have any problem if you guys wanted to light something with, you know, flashlights, you know, because it's about it's about knowing it's about having a sensibility about lighting in general, not about what tool you use. Because right. sometimes you're working in a scenario where, you know, I mean, the flashlight comes up a lot in uh, television. You know, the schlocky sort of cop drama stuff. They're in the warehouse at night, and the only thing the guy's got is a flashlight. So that becomes the interactive source with which the DP has to, you know, create mood and suspense and drama and everything. And he's so he's you know, pulling every trick out of the bag that he's got to make a flashlight work as a key light for, you know, an interior night scene in a warehouse. That's going to happen. It happens all the time in drama and, you know, scripted narrative uh, material. So I have no problem with you guys experimenting in that regard. The only time that I really impose the hard limits on people using their kit like that is, um, uh, you know, the argument that, uh, well, you know, I'm, a I'm an available light cinematographer and I, you know, I think that that's the best way to shoot. And so I don't agree with using artificial lights. That's coming from a person who doesn't know how to use artificial lighting tools. That's not coming from a point of view that they've discovered over the course of a career that exterior lighting is the best thing for their work, because obviously everything that you do doesn't happen outside. You know, you're going to do an interview inside, you're going to shoot a movie inside, you're going to have to work on a sound stage. You're going to have to do something where you're going to have to build light that looks real, dramatic, effective, uh, creative, all of those things. And so saying that you only light with available light is bullshit. Okay. Um, but you guys aren't those people, so we don't have to worry about that conversation. So if you ever want to experiment and try stuff, the best thing to do is you know, use the little form that I put on the on the getting started sections of these courses, uh, or just put a little docx word doc together of some submission notes and tell me this is what I was going for. These were my exposure settings. These were the lights that I used. Give me a set photograph of where your fixtures are working relative to the camera. Just tell me what you were doing in case it's not obvious to me as a third party looking at a frame grab, tell me what you were going for and help me understand the process you were going through so I can evaluate your performance effectively. Other than that, man, you can try, you can use whatever you want. Okay. Um, good lighting or knowing how to light well is, is, is a couple of things. It's, it's, first of all, it's knowing what and where good lighting is, where, where it occurs naturally and, and what it looks like. Uh, second is knowing how to emulate it, right? And third is is knowing how to spot it 
in the wild and and take it for what it is and shoot it when you when you've got it available to you uh and save yourself a little bit of work um so as long as i know that you know if you have a good sense of what a good key light looks like but then every time you shoot outside you're crushing your subject from the front with the hard sun i'm going to get an impression from you that you really kind of don't know what that's all about but whenever you shoot outside if you try to use the sun as a backlight initially and it and it and it works or if it doesn't you redirect it through some diffusion or use a bounce to give yourself a nice uh, standard looking key. Uh, that's somebody who I know has uh, exterior lighting literacy and that you're trying to use what you have available to you in the best means possible to create, you know, the, the, the aesthetic that we expect to see. Um, so there's a difference. Uh, there's a difference there in the, in the two technicians. And I, would be totally happy to see what you wanted to do. I mean, you could play with, car, you know, Christmas tree lights or China balls or, you know, whatever you want to try because there's so many different ways to generate these looks that don't necessarily have to be an airy kit or a Fabatech kit or an LED panel. Right. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Is, um, in the event that the school would, you know, change to like the LED lights or, you know, something else, is that something that, you know, us being this far in the program, like we could reach out to the school and say, hey, could you help us out? You know, we'll, we'll trade you <laughs> or something. Well, uh, I'm having those conversations and they're not going, they're not going well at the moment. Um, but the, uh, the good news is at least from, from Favatech side, uh, the one by one panel that Favatech is selling there, they're only asking uh, a, a, about 200 bucks for. Yeah. And the first time I heard that, uh, I, I said, what, you, you know, are we talking about the same product? Because complimentary products from other lines are starting at, you know, $800 and going up to $2,000 for pretty much the same product. And so I called them up They're They're in, um, they're in Orange County. There, I think they're in Irvine, California. I called them up and I spoke to the owner of the company and I said, you know, is this price for real? Can you guarantee this price? And she said, oh yeah, that's that's our price. We, you know, we're you know they're selling wholesale. You know, they're they're making money off of volume instead of on a per piece basis uh, to get the product out there and to establish the name of the company. So. Um, you can get right now a bicolor one by one panel from Favatech. Uh, look in their LED fixture section of their webpage, uh, not the kit section, the, the fixture section. Okay. Uh, and you'll see the 600 uh, BC uh, with a case and a stand for like, uh, I think it's, I think it's 220 with just the head and 240 with the head, the case and the stand. Uh, and so okay. you get bicolor 3200 to 5600 Kelvin in LED, and it already comes on the back with a V mount battery uh, dock. So when you buy the thing initially for 200 bucks, it has an AC adapter with it. But mm -hmm. if you have V mount batteries, uh, if you've got a, an ENG camera that uses V mount, or if you wanted to start collecting V mount batteries, you can use the light as a battery operated device as well. This one's got uh, Anton Bauer on the back, uh, but basically you can you can clip a. Uh, let's see if I got a. I don't have a. Um, I don't have a battery brick uh, nearby right now, but if you use an ENG camera on the back of the ENG cameras where the where the big batteries mount, they're either three three lug pin like what we have for Anton Bauer, or it's a V mount sort of a shoe mount uh, connector. And you, you rig your battery right on the back of that light, and you can walk around. You don't have to plug it in, and, the, and it'll last you most of the day, better part of the full day of shooting um, on that LED panel, which is pretty nice, um, especially if you work on location um, where there's not a lot of places to plug in your lighting equipment. Right. Um, okay. So, you know, you've got options like that that are available to you. I'm trying to get them to uh, issue two LED panels in a kit now instead of the fluorescent stuff. The difference in price was about $140, and, and right now their budgets uh, uh, are not allowing for that fluctuation in price. 
Um, and, and they're saying that it stems back to a lot of the financial aid and stuff that some of the students are getting that we have to restructure some of the financial aid program to raise the price of the lighting kit. So I don't know. The, these are the things that I'm up against right now in terms of the administration aspect of it, but I am trying to get them to think in that direction uh, yeah. because, you know, quite frankly, the fluorescent the kit is a little bit outdated or outmoded for the kind of work that we're asking you to start thinking about doing. Yeah. Right. Uh, but that's also part of your growth process. I mean, I remember when yeah. I was in film school, all we got were the crappy uh, Lowell DP kits, you know, and I thought for the first two or three years of my career that the only lighting equipment out there was 1K open face with uh, horrible hot barn doors and, and nasty uh, <laughs> um, nasty switches and, and cables that were covered in um, that, uh, that old um, fiberglass jacket that they used to use. And uh, you know, that's, you know, there are tools that we learn to use in film school. And then there are tools that we get exposed to in our professional lives. And, and part of becoming, you know, professional, uh, camera person is making those choices and, and then, you know, moving forward, you know, in our career and selecting the tools that we prefer to work with. Um, I know that right now tungsten Fresnels are real cheap and easy to acquire online. If, if you want to work with that mode of lighting, at least temporarily or for a while, um, because everybody's now dumping that gear and trying to get led as well. So, um, it's a good time to try a lot of conventional styles of equipment at a good price, like off of Amazon and stuff. Um, I paid 85 for mine. 85 bucks for the, one. Yeah. It came with the screens <coughs> stand came with uh, the scrims. It came with scrims. Beautiful. Was it a six fifty? Uh, that price or a 300. I think it was a six fifty. Six fifty with barn doors and scrims. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, yeah, it was, man. Go it was to the closeout. Yeah, go to the B and H so, website and look at the same light with the with the airy uh, with the airy logo on it, and they want about four hundred and sixty bucks for that light. Yep. So you know, I mean, if you can try it out with a with a Chinese knockoff for eighty bucks, and I mean, those lights will last a good long time. Um, at least as long as the as the as the airy stuff, it's all pretty much made in the same place anyway. Um, <laughs> it's definitely worth trying it out. I mean, you know, if you take that little six fifty and put some, uh, you know, even even half blue, you don't even have to go full blue correction. Now, technically, thirty two hundred Kelvin is what's coming out of the front of that Fresnel right now, and right. correct it to full daylight. You have to put eighty uh, A, or you have to put full ctb gel on that yeah, I, but um, that goes to 5600 kelvin and most of the time the the daylight the daylight in the world that i like the most the color i like the most is like 4800 degrees kelvin it's not 5600 that's too right. white looks too much like there's too much uv going on it doesn't look good with flesh and stuff makes people look pink so I'm usually knocking down a full daylight fixture to something like 46, 4,800 Kelvin anyway by adding orange to it. Well, if your light's already orange, instead of going all the way to full blue correction, go to half blue correction, and then you've only knocked it down a stop. Now your 650 is only a 300, and you can still work with that. I got a question. I haven't taken film lighting two yet. Um, do you go over like the gels and like the correction that you're talking about? Do you go over yeah. in that class? Yeah, in week one, I go over I go over a, a, a fair amount of that, and and a, and a fair amount of the reading is uh, is on color theory and color correction. Uh, some of those um, some of my FaceTime videos for that stuff uh, I've put on a YouTube page, a YouTube channel. So. Yeah, I, I will. In fact, let me write down your uh, – what's your uh, email address? Anthony. Yeah. Do, do you need gels? Um, I have uh, – I actually have a friend who just uh, went to California, and he came back with a master pack of gels for me, but uh, I don't know, like, you know, 
half or quarter or like it what does. you know change. Yeah, it looks like that. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a place called JG here in Vegas that they're basically they rent out everything you need for film sets. I mean, they they do everything for LA, everything to uh, Atlanta, all the places. And I went oh. there. I was selling. They were seven dollars a piece for four by fours, and he rolls them up and everything. And he even has the color palette where you can go through the book and pick out whatever which ones you want for yellow. There might be 50 different yellows, 50 different oranges, and reds and blues, and it's pretty cool. So if you're interested in that, I can always go in and get them and then just mail them to you. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. look on, yeah. Uh, look on um, does, he have, does he have a color picker on the website, uh, David, or? Do you have to already um, know your cat number? I actually, I actually went in person to see him because I wanted to meet him. Yeah. And because he's a veteran as well, that's how I got introduced to him. Okay. But I haven't been on their website to look, but I'll actually go on there after we're done with the. Well, class. you know what you can do um, is go to leefilters.com, and the entire Lee Gel catalog is is on that website. Uh, so you'll have all the categories separated by colors and diffusion and so forth and corrections and then by hue and then each each gel color has its catalog number uh, corresponding to it so you could in effect go to the Lee filters website first look at the palette that they have available pick a couple of colors write the catalog numbers down and then when you call JG you have more information you can give them which would be more helpful uh, oh, there for them when they're picking your stuff for you uh, because the gel cuts by the sheet, they come in two by two or four by four. Uh, they reference the gel catalog number when they sell you by the cut. So you're going to need to know that regardless. And if, if they've got to look it up for you, it's more of a hassle for them. So yeah, um, he, he had the book in front of him and it was basically, he was pulling out the blues and then I would pick that. It would be, well, we don't have that one in stock. You can go with this one. Did he have the, uh, like the, the swatch book kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You could probably get them to send you one of these uh, next time you order something from them. They're free from Lee Lighting. Oh, okay, cool. Um, but but before we go any further, Anthony, what's your email address? Well, I actually just emailed you. Ah, um, that bell. Okay. All right, good. Yeah. Work. Okay, I'll send you the link to the FaceTime videos. One of them is... Uh, the color theory uh, go-to that I did um, last uh, couple months ago, I think. Um, and, awesome. you know, we can do a color go-to, you and I, at any time you want, if you want to get caught up on something like that. That's no problem. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure. No problem. Um, yeah. Did I tell you about JR Lighting out in Vegas, or did you already know about oh, them? That, that, that's it. JR Lighting. That's, that's who it is. JR, yeah, JR Lighting is a pretty big uh, rental house. He's been there a long time. It was huge. Yeah, he rents a lot of lighting gear as well as sells expendables. So uh, you can do that. The other thing you can do is do you guys know about Film Tools in Burbank? Yeah. Film Tools sells gel by the roll or by the sheet. And, yeah, uh, and they also do a student discount. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So, um, you know, and they're, uh, you know, I don't know how well JR is geared towards his his online business model yet, but Film Tools, uh, you know, does 80% of their business online. So, um, you know, they they uh, they tend to carry pretty much everything you would want, uh, including equipment. You know, they sell equipment as well. So, um, and their website's pretty good. But if you want to know cat numbers for gels, I would definitely go to leaffilters.com first. Um, because that's the best for getting that information. They got a neat color picker too, and they help you combine colors, and they cross-reference with other gel companies, and it's a it's a pretty pretty comprehensive site. It's actually pretty nice. Awesome. Quick question about uh, this lighting assignment coming up around the clock. Uh huh. When we when we do uh, six o'clock, which is just right in front. Of the subject, right? The how do we position the light so it doesn't get in the way of the camera? Well, uh, 
Or is that just for us to figure out? <laughs> it's kind of for you to figure out, Chief. But okay. that's right. the thing. I mean, the obvious, the obvious solutions are you can go under the lens or you can go over the lens, right? Right. Um, but uh, I've done some stuff, uh, particularly for CBS and, and a lot of music videos, where we build uh, key lights out of fluorescence or LED, and uh, we shoot right through the right through the light. So, uh, um, but I kind of want to see what you know what you come what you come up with. Um, okay. Obviously, the the standard beauty key position is you know right over the lens at you know about sixty degrees with a bounce reflector directly under the lens, where you get that two to one. Uh, soft gradation from top to bottom uh for like l'oreal uh you know commercials or you know oh it's not me i'm you know i'm worth it you know my beauty is blah, blah. you know that kind of lighting you know is designed we call it over under the, the key light is over the lens and the bounce is right under the lens and okay. it gives you that nice uh two to one uh beauty uh shape which accentuates cheekbones and chin shape and forehead shape and nose shape and everything and gives you minimal little sort of butterfly shadows under the nose uh, right. when you're looking when you're talking about ladies cosmetics and stuff um, the other thing that we've done I've done this for um, for suave and for uh, I forget what the makeup company was but I took two soft boxes similar to what you guys are using now and put them side by side right next to the lens, right at eye level, and, and pounded those folks flat. Because when you get, uh, sometimes, you know, these, these, these models that they get to do some of this, uh, this work for these companies, their, their bone structure and their face structure is so stunning to begin with. The last thing you want to do is start introducing shadows that are going to sort of start redefining what, that amazing thing is that you've already got to work with. And so sometimes the smartest thing you can do with a, with a, with a model that's that striking is pancake them. Don't, don't even try to introduce any shape because they might have, they might have an amazing jaw structure or, you know, some kind of really just well-formed nose or nose and eyebrow right. relationship. You know, you got, you have several triangles within the shape of the human face that mm -hmm. define that that define subconsciously the 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 key points of association that our primitive brain identifies with stereotypical beauty. Certain spacing of the eyes is psychologically considered more beautiful than than others. Certain distances uh, between the eyes and the mouth are considered beautiful in our our Western culture subconsciously. And so when you start playing with the facial geometry with shadows and you've already got somebody who's got it going on without the use of shadows, sometimes the best choice is just flat light them, uh, soft front, even fill, and then give them, give them edge accents against their background. Give them a double back edge or something like that. That gives you a nice, a nice definition around the jaw and the hairline and pancake them, we call it. So uh, when you're talking about the six o'clock position, I, I want you to think about the implications of that because, you know, nine times out of 10, you, you are going to flatten them out unless you go low or, or really mm -hmm. high from the front. And then you introduce a certain set of shadows. If you go low, you introduce a certain sort of uh, subconscious uh, inflection, you know, into that image, you know, kind of scary, gaudy, you know, evil. Right. Top light has its own set of insinuations. So I want to see how you would solve that, you know, okay. and, you know, show me something that you think looks appropriate. Sure. I had a, I had to do a scene once where, uh, <clears throat> a mini driver plays the mother of a child who's getting sent to special ed and pull, pulled out of regular school. And the scene is, uh, it's, a. Uh, it's a it's a scene of confrontation. It's a scene of of deep seated resentment. The mother, Minnie, the mother, resents the idea that her child is being pigeonholed as special ed when when the kid is actually gifted and and has a, a more of an autistic issue than a than a cognitive processing issue. And so, 
the scene is 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 angst and it's anger and it's resentment and it's it's confrontation and so the scene is is heavily side lit all of the light comes through the windows of the classroom and we have the mother sitting out in the desks among the desks and we have the teacher sitting up on her sort of rostrum looking down at mom and then we have the principal comes in and joins the conversation and it becomes a three-way conversation between these people well at some point the principal enters and sits in a position where when we start going around that scene in terms of collecting all the coverage we got nice half light on mom and she's upset nice half lit in the reverse direction of the teacher who's equally upset at, at being accused but then we have to come around and we have to look at the principal now, you can look at the principal as an over, over mini onto the principal at an angle to give yourself a shot at some shape with that light that's now coming 90 degrees straight through the glass and hitting the principal flat. Or you can accept it for what it is and say, you know, in the real world, if I came around and I looked at this conversation from this perspective, which is kind of what I want, because I want her in the middle looking this way at mom and that way at the teacher as though she's caught in the middle between these two people. She's going to end up flat lit. Do I believe it? Does it look okay? Is it reasonable to assume that at some point this light, this form of light would happen in reality? And what do I have to do to clean it up so it's not, you know, very crude and just sort of, you know, I just came around and took the shot and didn't fix anything. You know, you do a little soft up close diffusion and you do what you can do for the light and then you let it play because sometimes. Sometimes it looks better to use the lighting that would happen in reality than to try and reshape it, because if you don't pull that off, if you don't pull your reshaping off, what you do is you take the viewer out of the moment. And they say, oh, they stopped the relight, you know, they lit themselves yeah. in the corner. And, and now, at least for a brief moment, your your audience is now thinking about the filmmaking instead of the story. Right. So the purpose of shooting at six o'clock is to see what, how you handle that. Okay. Sometimes you have to. Um, I have a question about the assignment as well. Yeah. Um, in my apartment, I have these egg shell off white walls. And when I light, it looks horrible because they look yellow, really yellow. And is it all right if I put a green screen up and just either turn it black or add a background to it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, you could also get, uh, I was telling somebody else this last month. Um, we use a lot of uh, what we call duvetine on sets, and we use it for a lot of different things. Duvetine is, uh, it's like a black, heavy cotton duck or a canvasy kind of material, and it's, it's usually sprayed heavily with a flame retardant uh, chemical, and it's, it's dyed heavily with black so that it's opaque, you know. And we use it to skirt lights out or blackout windows and stuff like that. But you can get some stuff that's pretty close. It's kind of expensive, too. It's, it's upwards of about eight eight fifty a square yard now from Film Tools. But I got some of this black. Uh, this is uh, flannel uh, I got from uh, Walmart in the textile department uh, for about a buck and a half a square yard about a buck 30 a square yard. And uh, this stuff is great because, you know, you can tack it up to a wall with thumb, you know, with push pins or something, you know, the, uh, I don't have any, I don't have any nearby right now, I mean, you know, push pins or uh, T pins or something and just tack it to a wall that's uh, out of the shot. But, you know, maybe it's giving you a lot of backlash or a lot of reflected light coming from a window or something. Tack this up. And, and black out the area off camera that you don't want to see. That'll help knock down a lot of the level in the room. Um, and then, of course, you could shoot into it, too. It's just black uh, black flannel, so you could use it as easily as a backdrop. And they got lots of different colors and patterns and stuff like that. And it's really, really cheap. And uh, we use stuff like that all the time on the sets to... Uh, to enhance what we're doing. And, and we use the black duvetine the most. So uh, maybe it's time for you to start thinking about using tools like that, that can help you also a little bit with your shaping. You know, if you took your, uh, if you took your soft box, 
sometimes when you use a softbox and you use it at eye level and you kind of point it at your your talent, you know, that's fine and it, it looks fine, right? But, you know, the light hits your talent, it keeps going, hits the wall on the other side, comes back as reflection, and you end up with a fill level that you never mm-hmm. intended, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, it it changes the shape of your subject to a large degree. You know, if you were to take Duvetine and put it on that wall, frame right of me, anything coming this way from the key light, it's going to hit the black and it's not going to return back. And it's going to look like what we call negative fill. In other words, black reflects just as much as white does, but in a different way that your eye has to be, you know, sort of accustomed to looking for. If I put a large amount of black on this side of me, just out of frame, as opposed to without it, you can see that it takes light away from my low side. And depending on how big this piece is, how much of that I'm taking out of the reflection aspect of what we're doing can have a great deal of effect on the shape, the overall shape of the light. Um, So, you know, maybe it's about time you started playing with tools like that. Awesome. You can tape it up with gaff tape, tape it to the wall. Just be careful on walls or you don't want to peel the paint. Gaff tape's a little sticky for that. Um, Black paper tape works a little better. Or uh, if you don't have that available to you, you can use uh, blue stuff that you can get at Home Depot that painters use as masking Mm -hmm. tape. Uh, And it holds really well, but when you go to pull it off a wall, it doesn't take any of the paint with it. Um, You can try using stuff like that. Um, That'll help. Um, but yeah, if you want to use a backdrop, you know, go right ahead. Uh, I think you did some of that anyway in lighting one with, uh, you did some, uh, some green screen stuff, didn't you, uh, David? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So, you know, absolutely. Um, I I want, you know, I want you to, I want to encourage you guys to experiment if you feel comfortable with the concepts such as they are to experiment within the confines of those concepts and, and show me how, you know, that's a big part of this really is, uh, you know, we give you in your education, a, you know, a standard set of tools and a standard set of instructions on how to use those tools. And that's designed to get your feet underneath you, to get you up and running. But it's not designed to sustain you throughout your career as a lifestyle, a creative style or as a, as a mode of, of, of working. It's designed to get you going, and then over time, you you start changing these variables out, trying new tools, trying new styles, and developing your own look and your own sense of style that way. That's what this is all about. I mean, otherwise, the, the tool set really is fairly limited. You know, there's not that many not that many things to choose from in terms of right. lighting equipment, but there's lots of different ways to think about using that lighting equipment. Um, like I was saying, you know, you use the softbox as a side light, right, and then just showed you how to kill a lot of spill well sometimes a softbox from here looks very similar to the softbox from over the top and slightly in front of the subject it'll look very similar depending on how the subject is moving in that in that lit space and so sometimes a softbox as a top light does a better job than a softbox as a side light from the floor and then you take the the black um the black felt or the black uh, uh material that I showed you and you clip it around the edge of the softbox and you make a skirt or a snoot that extends down another 12 to 15 inches below the softbox and and it helps to sort of focus all that light down instead of out towards the walls and you can put a really nice looking key in the center of a room and have it do a lot of work and you can have your character actually walk in a fairly big circle, six or eight feet in diameter, depending on how high you can get that softbox. But if you've snooted it nicely down with some black felt, it'll keep the levels on your walls darker than they would if the key was, if the light was on the floor as a side light, bouncing and reflecting off all the other yellow walls. And you can get the level way down and then use black felt on any surfaces that are out of the frame that might reflect any value back into the frame and cover them with black felt as well. And you'll find that 
the look of your photography will change dramatically if you do that. That's awesome. That's why we shoot on black sound stages. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, man. We put if if a sound stage isn't already painted black on the inside um, in pre production, we'll paint them black. Or if the house doesn't want us to paint. We'll go in and we'll hang black textiles on all the walls, big giant black curtains to get all the mm -hmm. reflective, to minimize the number of reflective surfaces that are coming just from the room you're shooting in. You know, the floor right. can be a reflective nuisance if it's the wrong color. Uh, so floors should be dark gray or black. Uh, walls should be black if possible. If not, we got to hang curtains. And then we introduce a lot of black panels on set to, to kill a lot of the reflection as well. When you're working really hard to create shape by directionality, the last thing you want is to introduce diffusion into the situation that will work against all of your shaping that you're trying to do over here on your subject. And a light that bounces off a wall and returns on your subject is adding a level of fill that you may or may not be aware of. It has a lot to do with, uh, you know, controlling the look of what you're, what you're trying to do, trying to create. Right. Awesome. What do you think of that line? Yeah. Yeah. I could listen to this stuff all day. <laughs> yeah, that's well. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, there's a lot to think about, but um, you know, it's pretty cool because uh, you know that's a concept that I don't always get a chance to touch on because there's so much you know other stuffs that I need to cover that you know negative yeah. fill a lot of times gets pushed to the back burner or you know sometimes get put gets pushed off of the uh, agenda for discussion because there's just not enough time to cover it you know sometimes mm -hmm. i have trouble getting kids to understand that you can bounce a light off a card and have it you know soften it up and make it look nice you know let alone explaining mm -hmm. that black will do the same thing like you know <laughs> i lose them at that point <laughs> <laughs> awesome so other than that 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 assignment should be f fairly self-explanatory right yeah, yeah. totally and you understand that I want I want to see you start wh whatever position you're at on the clock. You're going to shoot an eye level, a, a below eye level, and above eye level angle on it, right? So you can see how it changes. Right. Right. Yeah. So you're going to end up with. Yeah. Uh, I think I st I stopped you eight times on the clock times three is twenty four. You should have twenty four frame grabs. Right. And, uh, you know, you don't have to edit them into anything, but if you put them on a, just, just string them together into a one big video clip, throw them up on mm -hmm. YouTube. And the reason why is because if you, if you isolate a moment in time, we look at the lighting, you know, we can make all kinds of academic evaluations about what the light's doing and whether it looks good or not, whether the subject is, you know, flattering or not. But one aspect that we don't get in the still image it is more important to our understanding is how that subject is moving in that light space. You know, how does the light look as the subject turns into or away from the key light? Does the subject look better with a key light that's positioned three quarters or two thirds behind him or two thirds in front of him? What's more favorable to look to me? It doesn't seem to make much difference, but to some people it does. Do I want my key to light most of my face or just some of my face? Because I can, I can define the shape of my face by lighting just this sliver if I want to and take about 30 pounds off of my look. If I have a, a low side that's predominant on my face, and just separate it from the background with a little kicker, right? I can make myself look a lot thinner. Yeah. Here it looks like I just got back from Papa John's. <laughs> Here it looks like I haven't eaten in a couple of days. Yeah. You know? It probably depends on the project that you're doing too. Or the person you're shooting, right? I mean, person. let's say, you know, let's say you got a, you know, a female actress who's, self-conscious about her weight right and you light her like this and she says oh man you know the camera puts on 20 pounds <laughs> and the camera does but lighting guys can take that 20 pounds off by moving the key light hmm. 
right? Right. So that's another reason why you want to know. I mean, does the key light always have to come from in front of me and 45 degrees off axis slightly above my eye level? No, not at all. If you don't have any other wherewithal and if you don't have any other ideas or opinions about it, then your key light should be 45 degrees off access and slightly above eye level, or you're not going to get anything that looks worth worth paying you for. Right. right. Some folks don't have the aptitude to look at a, a subject and, and decide whether or not the key light needs to move. But I'm not, we're not, we're not, we're not trying to teach that guy here. I'm yeah. trying to get you to decide whether or not this looks better on me and make a, make a professional choice and make a decision. You know, right. that's a great tip. We got an old, we have an old saying in the lighting business. If you know how to light, it doesn't matter what tools you use. And if you don't know how to light, it doesn't matter what tools you use. <laughs> you get it? Yeah. Right. So it's not about the tools. Right. Right. That's why that's why you're doing that assignment. I just think moving forward, we're going to move it down so you get it sooner in your education so that you can yeah. start thinking about that before now. I think it'll help you more in lighting two to, to have that sort of consciousness in your head going into lighting two. And yeah. then uh, I've got a new, I got a new whiz bang assignment for, for cinematography too, for lighting. It's, uh, you know, how to sweeten things up and double diffuse and how to do some of the things like we're talking about with negative fill and with cosmetic uh, diffusions and things like that, that change and alter the looks of people beyond the standard tool set so that you guys, and I'll put that uh, for anybody who misses it in the coursework, I'll put that video up on the YouTube channel uh, as a Perfect. Time video as well. So you'll get to Great. Come and access that. Thank you. So what do you think? Can you do it now? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you um, can do it. <laughs> I got a question that's kind of off topic of lights. Um, what would be a good shutter speed setting for our camera to avoid motion blur on doing a, a quick pan or somebody walking through from frame right to frame left? All right. You got two different concepts happening there. You got motion blur and right. you have, you have uh, persistence of vision on a pan. Um, in the old days when we were shooting film for a living, uh, the rule of thumb was a pan that went 120 degrees or what would basically be from all the way from frame left to frame right, that the duration of that pan should not be shorter than seven seconds. So 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007. Right, because if you pan any quicker than that, twenty-four frames of film going through the film gate, there would be too much missing motion in between each frame that happened. In other words, as the you know it's going ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk twenty-four frames a second, right? And sometimes the shutter's open, sometimes the shutter's closed, but the whole time the camera is moving across the frame. So if you move too quickly, there's big chunks of motion that haven't been recorded because the shutter was closed at the time that the camera was moving. So in order for you to get enough pieces, enough slices that could be watched together as a sequence and appear not to strobe on, on the projection screen, was to be at least seven seconds for a complete pan from left to right. Seven seconds. All right. Now... <clears throat> Now we're digital, right? And we don't have a shutter per se anymore. So some of the physics have changed in terms of how we're capturing. It's happening at 60 cycles a second instead of 24. Uh, but still, the seven second panning rule is still playing a viable part 
in your aesthetic. And, and the reason is because of the, um, the, uh, the jello effect that you get from the CMOS sensor and the, um, the way that the progressive scan captures your image 60 times a second. You'll notice people talk about the jello effect and they'll show you, oh, the rotating, the rotating shutter of the Sony A7R2 is terrible when you, when you shoot, uh, subway cars in New York. You can see the windows doing this as the subway car goes flying by, right? That's because, well, the camera's static. The train that's going by is going by faster than seven seconds, right? So any vertical lines tend to rake back against the direction of movement, okay? Because the chip is trying to catch up. You know, it starts scanning at the top of your frame when the door of the streetcar is here. But by the time the door of the streetcar gets over here, the scan is down here, and so the streetcar door looks like that instead of straight, okay? So whether it's digital or whether it's film, it's all about going slow enough to allow whatever the capture device is doing to capture enough pieces that when you string it together, it looks like a nice fluid move. Now, Thanks. motion blur is a, is a different thing. Motion blur has to do with the relative speed of movement of your subject and the shutter speed of your camera. Right. Now, if you shoot still photography and you have experience with changing shutter speeds, you'll know that you have this whole range of shutter speeds to choose from. In video, we've got a few. We've got a handful. Most of the time, we're on the same one all the time. 24 frames per second has a relative shutter speed duration of 1 48th or 1 50th of a second. All right. But if you shoot stills, you know, you got that and all, all kinds of stuff in your pocket. You know, if you want to freeze action, you don't shoot subject. If you shoot football or if you shoot basketball or race cars, you don't shoot that subject at a 50th of a second. You're shooting that subject at a 2 50th of a second, 500th of a second, you know, maybe a thousandth of a second to freeze the motion that's happening in front of the camera, because if you can't pan with a moving subject to eliminate some of that persistent blur, then the shutter speed will make up for the difference by minimizing the duration that it's open and exposing to light. Your f-stop is affected, everything's affected by it, but you find the right balance of exposures to accommodate that higher shutter speed. Now, you can shoot at a higher shutter speed with video. If, for instance, you're doing green screen work and you have a couple of actors doing fight scene in front of a green screen and you got a lot of movement happening that a 50th of a second is showing you a lot of motion blur and making it hard for your special effects guy to cut in to cut your masks. You can change your shutter speed on the camera to something higher. You'll have to, you'll have to open up your f-stop to accommodate for that. Um, because it's going to affect your exposure when you do it, but you can do that. Uh, and you can do that with digital video a lot easier than we could do it with film. It was a, it was a big deal to change your, to change your shutter speed when we shot film, but now you can do it fairly easily. Just go into your camera settings, change your, you might have to come off. You might have to come off 180 degree shutter to do it. You might have to go to 140 degree shutter. Uh, you can change your, camera shutter speed to any of the still speeds that you have for your photographic function of the camera. Open up your f-stops to accommodate your change in shutter speed and shoot at a higher shutter speed. Okay. They'll do that a lot for football uh, at the network level. And what they'll do is uh, because the 48th of a second on television um, and because we have so many different markets with different frequency um, assignments around the globe, um, sometimes sports suffers from shooting at a standard frequency, like a 50th of a second shutter speed and 60 cycles and all this. And they'll shoot 720p and they'll shoot at, say, a 250th of a second shutter speed on the broadcast cameras, change the f-stop to uh, accommodate the exposure. and so that when when you see the guys running on the screen, it looks crisper, right? 
because that was part of the whole the whole thing about HD was supposed to be that uh, high definition video was going to look so much better than broadcast standard video uh, that you were going to want to run out and buy an HD TV tomorrow or you were going to die. Um, but the broadcast standard was only 720p to begin with. And so with sports, it didn't look much better than it did at uh, broadcast standard NTSC, which was uh, 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 680 lines. So you were only off by uh, 40 lines of resolution between NTSC broadcast standard that went all the way back to the 70s and HD TV, which was brand new and costing you $2,000 for a new TV set. So they started playing with the shutter speeds and getting the sports to look more more crisp and more frozen in time so that you got this hyper perception of sharpness and clarity um, that you weren't getting with the NTSC standard. So that's kind of where that comes from. And you can do that with your camera as well. Um, just be aware that, you know, do some tests and, and watch what happens when you do that because the look of that video is going to have a, um, there's going to be something about it that's going to, it's going to be, it's going to stand out to you as being strange or uncomfortable or wrong or some people perceive it as too video-y, the look that you get when you use a high-speed shutter angle like that um, because it's so crisp, right? Um, it's not part of our visual aesthetic. Crisp sharpness is way down our human list of priorities in terms of our visual aesthetic. Okay, the number one aesthetic is uh, shape. The number two aesthetic is color. The number three aesthetic is spatial relationship or position in the frame. And way down that list is sharpness and, you know, whether we can hear or not smell it. You know, all that stuff is way down the list. So, um, so when you use that skinny, we call it skinny shutter. When you use a skinny shutter too often, it becomes a bit of a cliche, right? You know, sort of like how, you know, the minute everybody decided that Canon 5D was okay, everybody went out and shot shallow depth of focus, and now we all we have are these bouquet videos that are getting kind of boring and overplayed. It's the same thing, you know. You want to you want to use it as a as a tool once in a while to get you out of a tight spot, but don't rely on it as a, as a way of uh, as a standard for capturing video. All right. Okay. Do some tests and look at it. You'll see it's really hard to explain beyond that. It's um, the degree of clarity and sharpness is is um, is not what we're yet used to. You know, it's it's still a little too surreal. What do you think? Oh no, I, I agree hundred percent. Yeah, because I, I I filmed uh, the mountain climbing scene. And I did it at 200 frames per, well, the shutter speed was at 200. And it actually worked out. But then when I went to do the editing, it looked totally different. Color and everything, it was really odd. And I had to do a lot more um, upping my inputs of black and, and just to make it look to match the other scenes that I did without, you know, just shooting at 60, for, uh, a shutter speed at 60. Your shadow detail turn colors and stuff? Um, not as much. Um, I noticed the glasses did though. The, the glasses were blue and they, they almost turned purple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of that, again, in the days of film, we would call that reciprocity failure. Um, I'm not sure what they call it in the digital universe now, but basically the idea is, uh, in order for a blue glass, to, to render as blue has as much to do with the proper exposure of the glass than the color of the glass itself because you can actually change the color of the glass depending on whether you over or underexpose the image. If you grossly underexpose an image, you can also start changing the actual hues of the subject because the natural reflectivity that that subject possessed in terms of its color had been altered by an insufficient or over maximum amount of time that you exposed that subject. And this came into play for time exposures 
um, where you wanted to do a shot with a really, really infinite amount of depth of field, like an F64 or an F128 exposure, and you leave a shutter open for four or five minutes, or time exposures of, of star trails in particular, or nightscapes where you do a time exposure, time lapse of a cityscape, and the and the night sky has a green or a brown tinge to it. That was all reciprocity failure, and it had to do with um, extraordinary lengths of exposure time in a photochemical relationship between um, silver nitrate and and um, photons or light, and the conversion that happens as a as a result of exposure. And I think digital has a similar sort of problem that exists in that you know if you want to render a, a particular color and it's you know, exposure in a, in the digital sense is now a relationship of uh, voltage to the capture device and the amount of time that the capture device is given to record that voltage fluctuation. And if it's not sufficient, you're going to see something is going to suffer in the process of insufficient exposure. And I think when you uh, when you have a situation where you've changed the shutter speed and it's just too high, and you haven't allowed the image to bake in long enough in on the chip. The chip has a certain refresh rate that works a lot like a uh, a shutter speed. So if if that refresh rate hasn't been allowed to fully render, if you've cut a portion of that pie away by changing the shutter angle of your camera, then you're going to change the act the color accuracy of the chip. And in your case, you ended up with purple cups instead of blue cups. So what that tells you is you probably shouldn't exceed 180 shutter speed on your camera because 250 is is giving you reciprocity failure. Okay. Okay. It's crazy. It is crazy. It shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't have to think this hard about it. <laughs> but, but this stuff will happen. Um, the other way to cure it is, of course, you know, if you want to shoot at 250, you have to change the level of all your lighting to accommodate how many stops from a 50th of a second to a 250th is how, how many F stops? 50 to 100 is one F stop. 100 to 200 is another F stop. 200 to 250 is about two and a quarter f-stops. So if you have one 650 watt light lighting your scene and you change to a 250th of a second shutter angle, you have to add two more 650 watt lights to your shot, to your lighting scenario to get it bright enough. You see? And that happens on commercials a lot when we want to shoot um, bubbles in a glass of beer and have them come out sharp instead of blurry. At a 60th or 50th of a second, when you pop the top on the Budweiser and pour it in the glass, still looks good, still looks like Bud, but you don't get that crisp look of the bubbles when the foam sets and they put the glass on the counter and the camera's right in there. Mm, Budweiser, blah, 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 you know, and you look and the bubbles are all blurry that are coming up from the bottom of the glass. If you want those bubbles to be sharp, you got to change your shutter angle. And when you do that, you go from using one 10,000 watt light to four on the set. And that, you know, that's a trade secret that goes back, you know, decades. That's, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, guys would get paid a lot of money to know. And a guy right out of film school wouldn't know. And that would be, you know, the reason why you'd want to go work in Hollywood for 10 years before you started shooting your own commercials. But we don't got that kind of time now. You guys got to know this coming out of the gate. So um, in your case, David, don't go above 125 or 180 until you can start adding twice or three times the lights to your setups that you're doing. Uh, or do the, do the shot outside where you got plenty of light. Right. You know? Usually you can get away with, uh, like if you went from 150th to 100th of a second or 125th of a second, that's only one stop underexposed. And a lot of times that doesn't look bad and you're okay. But beyond that, 
Um, on your camera, I wouldn't go further than two and a half, three stops underexposed, or you'll find your material just doesn't look usable. It's too noisy. Um, right. Some of the better professional cameras, you can only go four, five, six stops underexposed, and and then they look like garbage too, you know. Um, so this is a limitation that you'll learn uh, and you'll become more comfortable with over time. Um, but know that it exists. It exists for the pros as much as it exists for you. It's just mm. you know, with your little five thousand dollar camera, you run into this problem at two stops. And they run into the problem at five stops underexposed. But the speed limit is still there for everybody. It just depends on what kind of camera you're using. Right. It's the limitation of the tool, right? I mean, the FS700 is a great camera. You know, you can shoot local TV commercials with that and interviews and documentaries and low-budget features and everything. But at some point, as you become more knowledgeable in what you like to see, in how you craft your images, uh, and the kinds of content you're shooting, you'll start to feel the resistance or the limitations of that little Sony camera. And that'll be about the time that you'll be looking at a new camera to, to, to go with to shoot your work moving forward. Yeah, I just wish they would have gave us um, some prime lenses instead of just the one lens. Dude, go get some. They're cheap. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm working on that. Go so to the pawn shop, man. I'm serious. Go to the pawn shop. If you go online to Amazon and get a little uh, Sony Nex to whatever adapter, 10, 15 bucks on Amazon or eBay, right? Then go to the pawn shop, you know, or go to the pawn shop first. You got to pick your lens first. Mm -hmm. Go to Joe's Cash and Carry Pawn, where some poor bastard just traded in a whole set of vintage Rocor Minolta lenses. For twenty five bucks, so we could go back to the blackjack table, and you mm -hmm. buy for probably five or ten or fifteen dollars a beautiful Rocor X fifty millimeter one point four, which in its day was worth about four hundred fifty five hundred dollars, and you get a Minolta to Sony X adapter, and you pop that bad boy on the front of your camera, and see how your world changes. Right, you're gonna love that. That's gonna yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's what the, that's what I think is going to take our camera to the next level. Oh yeah, dude, that'll blow your mind because, I mean, the lens that you have on your camera now, it's enough to get the job done. It's enough to get you going and starting to learn about these concepts. But if you oh, want to sure. shoot at one four with shallow depth of focus and you don't want your f stop to change when you zoom your lens in a little bit, you're gonna have to start using different tools. But yeah at least you know the limitations of the tool that you have to work with so that, you know, when you graduate, you know, you can rent your camera out and you can shoot with your camera the way it is right now and you can make money with it. But you're going to have a client at one point that's going to say, oh, you know, I saw this look and uh, they're doing on this other product and it looks like this. And you go, oh, yeah, that's, that's a, I, I need a different lens for that. And then, you know, you go out and make that happen. Um, but prime lenses, man, I, Jesus, I got, I mean, I'm a big fan of the Rokinon primes and the um, Zeiss primes. Um, it's like, I just like the look that I get from them and uh, the quality and the versatility more than a zoom. You see, for me, the only convenience of a zoom is that I can change focal length without having to change lenses, and that's not a good enough reason for me. <laughs> I mean, if I want to go to a 200, I'm going to go to a big honking 200 f2, you know, and get the shallow, crazy, shallow depth of focus shot, you know, that I can't get with the 200 millimeter adjustment on your kit lens anyway. Most of the times, yeah. a kit lens is nothing more than giving you the ability to shoot out of the box because you can't wait or because you don't have any other lenses to work with. But as soon as you get a set of primes, you'll probably find that, you know, a 24 or a 35 millimeter T2 is on your camera more than the kit zoom that came with it. Right. Because you're just going to yeah. like the way that looks a lot better. Have you ever used a fisheye lens? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I go, uh, my, 
my personal lens inventory goes all the way down to uh, eight millimeter. Oh, okay. And goes all the way up to uh, six hundred millimeter. Oh wow! So That's pretty cool. yeah, uh, you know, you don't you I don't. I don't use wide angle lenses as much as I use telephotos though. I don't like all of this real estate um, outside of the frame to me is just taking attention away from the point of focus, which should be right here. So if I'm telling you something meaningful and ironic, do I care whether or not that's in the shot? You know, so my, right. you know, my framing is, in here you know this stuff out here is you know so uh you don't get bored listening to me talk for an hour um but i don't need to know this i see this once in a, in a scene in a master shot and i know where i am and then after that all the performance is right in here <laughs> not on me because i'm a terrible actor but you know, on, right. a, on any actor that's doing a really good job, you don't want to be across the room when they give their Academy Award winning performance. You don't want to be right. across the room on a wide angle lens. Right. You want to be able to anticipate that moment and be right in there on it, on a 50 or an 85, where right. you get nice facial rendering nice close-up image and all that emotion is pouring into the screen nice and big so that's my awesome. two that's my two cool. cents it's good man it's good yeah awesome training i'm glad that i'm glad that i got a chance to get you guys back online here because i felt really i felt terrible that i, I missed you like that it's all good. I think it's uh, I got to reach out to online support because you didn't even get that we had registered, right? And didn't even let you know. Or yeah, but again, I think that's a I think that's a Citrix thing. It doesn't really have anything to do with our guys on our side. You see, they oh. they give us this LMS, which is great, right? I mean, go to training registration is here, but unless Citrix, you know, Citrix is the one that tells me that you've registered, right? Yeah. That's part of when I say, put this on my calendar. Cause when I create, when I create a, uh, a go-to session, I have a calendar and I say, register on the calendar. And what that's supposed to do is, is anybody who goes in and registers, it, it pings them with reminders when the class is coming up, like every uh, three days out, one day out, an hour out, and then 10 minutes out, you're supposed to get a ping from Citrix telling you that you have a meeting that you signed up for. And it tells me as well, tells me how many people, and it tells me, don't forget, blah, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I didn't know who was signed up. So uh, I'll get it sorted out. If I think it's kind of on me. Um, I'll get it sorted out so that uh, this doesn't happen anymore. It's all good. Man, it would be great if um, any time that, you know, you can just – you know, shoot us like links of things you think, you know, be good for us to know and uh, articles or any deals that you see out there with like the lights, like you said, or gels yeah. or lenses. Uh, that's what, uh, that's what uh, the community forum is supposed to be about, you know? Um, so yeah. that not just me, but any of you guys too. I mean, if you find a really great deal, you know, like David, you found a good deal on a 650. Fire that bad boy up on the community forum and let everybody know what you found, and let's all share. You know, I try to. Um, I mean, I'm I, I'm building these courses for you, so the videos that you're watching have been picked by me already. Um, and when I find a new one or one that I think does a better job, I try to substitute out something that might already be in the syllabus for a newer, better video, or I make my own if I feel my own video would work better. Uh, or sometimes I'll put it in, I have a new category. Uh, uh, you'll see it in the cinematography too. It's called the um, um, additional material, additional resources at the end, at the right. end of every week. 
uh, and that's where I'll put uh, extra videos or extra readings or something that I feel is relevant to what we're talking about. So I'm trying to do that. Um, and if you want me to tell you about cool equipment deals and stuff, I can do that too. I haven't been asked that yet. So you're the first. So. Um, I did, I did notice when you asked me to post on the discussion board, um, uh, there was no place to post. On, on the community discussion board in our, on our class. Really? Yeah. It, it, the only thing I had this to, um, to add was a conversation between the instructor and the student. Um, at least on my end. Let's see. If you, let's see. Submissions, views, audit. Yeah, this is the standard. Uh, all right, let me look into that because they're supposed to be up at the top here. There's supposed to be a little flag that says uh, group discussion or community discussion. So let me see what's oh, going on with that. I'll check that out in my end to see if it is. I will uh, see if there's something going on with that. All right, cool. You guys have a great night. All right. Uh, I hope that – did you get all your questions answered? Oh, definitely, yeah. More than enough. Okay, good. <laughs> More than you wanted to know. <laughs> no, no. Actually, I, I was like off-subject stuff. I like to hear that stuff too about the lights and, you know, the deals cool. and lenses and cool. shutter speeds and stuff like that. Great. Awesome. All right, then. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Have a good evening. Anthony, you good to go? You got anything else you want to talk about? Uh, I think I'm good for tonight, but uh, yeah, love to have these again. This this was awesome, okay. so awesome. appreciate it. Well, I'll see you guys again then next week. And uh, in the meantime, if something comes up and you need you know need to talk or you need answers to something, uh, shoot me an email, or we can do a go to session. Uh, you know, just let me know what your schedule is, and we can arrange something. Okay, perfect. All right. I see All you right, guys. All right, later. Have a good evening. See you guys. Talk to you soon.